Hi everyone and welcome to the second episode of the podcast for the Journal of Neuromuscular Diseases. I'm Grace McMacken, I'm a trainee neurologist and today I am delighted to be, to be welcoming two experts to discuss their latest research in the field of 5Q spinal muscular atrophy. So I have with me today Professor Angela Abbott who is a clinical geneticist and a neuromuscular expert at the Medical Genetics Centre in Munich and the Friedrich Bauer Institute at the Department of Neurology in Munich. And I'm also really pleased to welcome her colleague, Dr. Theresa Neuhan, who is a clinical geneticist at the Medical Genetics Centre in Munich. We're so grateful to have your combined expertise and knowledge to tap into for our podcast today. So today we are discussing 5Q spinal muscular atrophy, which is a disorder that I think most of our listeners will have some experience of. Um, Professor Abbott and Dr. Neuhan have been working towards some really interesting techniques which aim to improve the genetic diagnosis of this condition. Um, so we're going to start by just discussing some background to 5Q SMA before we delve into the research in a bit more detail. So, Professor Abbott, I wonder if you could maybe start by giving us a bit about the background of the sort of clinical presentation and the genetics of this disorder. Can you refresh our understanding of that? Yes, thank you, Grace. I will try to introduce a little bit to the spinal muscular atrophy. So we know that it's one of the most common neuromuscular disorders and in Germany, there is an, it is an autosomal recessive disorder and the carrier frequency in Germany is 1 to 40, which is really high. So it is an important disorder and um, we know for a long time that the underlying pattern mechanism is a progressive loss of spinal motor neurons and a resulting skeletal muscle weakness. So um, the clinicians, they they, they classify the disease based on the age of onset and the degree of the motor function impairment. And so there are three classes, SMA type, type 1, 2, and 3. And um, the most severe type is the SMA type 1 with children that have symptoms really immediately after birth or shortly after birth and also in limited life expectancy but there are milder forms in sma type 2 and 3 the children reach some of their motor milestone stones and symptoms develop later in childhood or even in adulthood so the disease underlying gene is the survival motor neuron 1 gene smn1 on the long arm of chromosome 5q and the disease is caused by a loss of SMN1. So, because it follows autosomal recessive inheritance, if you have only one copy of the fully functional SMN1, then that's enough not to get sick. But if you have no copy of SMN1, you will develop symptoms. So, most patients with SMA are homozygous for a deletion of at least exon 7 of SMN1. The problem is now that the region on chromosome 5Q where SMN1 is located is very complex. So there are many repetitive sequences, there are pseudogenes, there are retrotransposons and deletions and inverted duplications. So it's a complicated genomic region. And then SMN1 has an almost identical copy gene in this region. And this gene is called SMN. Two, they are almost identical, so they have they differ only by a few nucleotides. But whereas SMN1 exclusively produces correct RNA and protein, SMN2 predominantly produces misplaced RNA and a non-functional protein. So only about 10% of the transcripts of SMN2 are correctly spliced and generate a functional protein. And so we now know that the number of SMN2 gene copies varies in the human population. So one can carry between one and six SMN2 copies per genome. And the number of SMN2 copy genes correlates with the disease severity. So 
In general, the more copies of SMN2 you have, some remaining functional protein, the less severe is the disease. Okay, fantastic. That's, that's a really great overview to the complexities of this disorder. So even though it's probably one of the more common autosomal recessive disorders that we might see at the neuromuscular genetics clinic, the diagnosis isn't always straightforward, therefore. Is that correct? Teresa, want, do you want to answer? Yeah, so the, yeah, the genetics are complex and also the the um, presentation of SMA can be challenging. The clinical diagnosis can be challenging because it's not always the classical manifestations that we would expect, but we can also have atypical cases. Um, but it's so important um, to diagnose SMA because not only it's important to have a diagnosis for a symptomatic patient, but also because it has become quite famous now because it's um, one of the first treatable genetic neuromuscular disorders. Um, first of all, the first drug that was um, <clears throat> that was uh, that came to the market for SMA was nucinersin, <laughs> which is an antisense oligonucleotide and can help um, that um, SMN2 is expressed more in SMA patients. Um, but now we have even more drugs, um, for example, Aristiplam, which is um, a um, small molecule, and it can also increase correct expression of SMN2 and increase expression of SMN2. And then one of the most groundbreaking developments in SMA therapy was the approval of Zolgensma, which is a gene therapy um, based on an AAV vector. Um, and it can actually replace the mutated SM1 gene copy with a functional copy of the gene. So this is, um, all these therapies are usually only really effective or even most effective when they're administered very, very early in the, in the course of the disease. So especially in infantile presenting SMA very early in life. And um, Therefore, it's crucial to start the treatment as early as possible and to detect these patients. That's also why SMA has now been included in newborn screening in many populations. So the, the genetic diagnosis, as you've alluded to in, in your fantastic paper, is not always straightforward. Um, I wonder if you can maybe explain some of the practical challenges that we have to overcome and maybe some things that people aren't aware of whenever we're whenever we're sending our tests for SMA. So if a clinician thinks about SMA, the usual testing he will order is a MLPA called, it's called MLPA stands for multiplex ligation probe amplification. And this is a technique where you can reliably identify a homozygous deletion of SMN1, and this is the underlying cause in 96% of patients. So most patients will be diagnosed by MLPA testing. There are just a minor minority of about 4% of patients that have a heterozygous SMN1 deletion on one of their alleles and another point mutation on the second allele. And these patients can be also identified by MLPA testing because MLPA also identifies these heterozygous SMN1 deletions. So if you have a symptomatic patient, and you order MLPA and you find a heterozygous SMN1 deletion, then you move on and go to sequencing for SMN1. However, this starts to be kind of tricky because of this very similar SMN2 copy. You have to be very sure if you apply a sequencing technology that you really sequence SMN1 but not SMN2. So in Sanger sequencing, usually you first apply a long range PCR with specific primer for SMN1 to be then sure to have sequences of SMN1 and not to lose any variants in SMN1. Okay, so even if you have a really high index of clinical suspicion um, with these tests, you, you may still end up missing some cases. Um, and then equally, sort of on the converse to that, if there's a patient and they kind, you know, maybe don't have the specific features or it doesn't come first to your mind that this could be SMA um, and you're, you're doing 
your standard whole exome sequencing or maybe a panel, is there a chance that you're going to miss an, an SMA diagnosis that way? Yes, of course you can. This is the danger, I think. Yeah. What what clinicians always order if they don't have an idea what could be the clinical suspicion, they order exomes. <laughs> and the standard technique for exome sequencing now is short read next generation sequencing. And this is also tricky for those regions like SMN1. Um, I think there's the expression of, of dark regions or dead zones for NGS technology whenever you have a complex genomic region with many repetitive elements or with homologous genes and SMN1 and SMN2 are located in such 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 a re region. And from the technique with short read NGS sequencing, you always sequence only 150 base pair reads of this length. And because SMN1 and 2 are so similar, um, for most of the reads, you won't tell whether they derive from SMN1 or from SMN2. And this is a problem for the bioinformatic pipelines because you, can, you cannot unambiguously map them to the reference genome. And if those reads are not mapped correctly, then they usually are marked as having a low mapping quality and then they might be skipped or variants in these reads are not called. So in this way, you, you, you are always at risk to lose variants in those complex genomic regions, and especially in SMN1. Okay. Excellent. Thank you for explaining that. Um, could you also explain why MLPA, this sort of standard first test that we might use for um, approaching an SMA patient, why might that miss some cases? Yeah, so you, we wouldn't have thought this because the textbook says that, and also the German guidelines, they say you shouldn't miss a patient because these 96% of patients have the homozygous deletion and the remaining 4% will be detected by MLPA because you see the heterozygous deletion. But we were very excited that in our study, we found that two patients were carrying B allelic SNVs in SMN1, and this has never been described before. And both patients had a kind of a diagnostic odyssey. So in both patients, the initial clinical diagnosis really was 5Q SMA. So the clinicians were sure this should be SMA, but they did MLPA and the diagnosis was not confirmed. So in all records, it is written SMA was excluded by MLPA. But indeed, it, we found out that they harbor two SNV and one patient was an adult, one was a child, so the adult patient was a diagnosis 48 years of age, but her symptoms started already at age 7. The initial diagnosis was MLPA. Finally, they thought about an axonal neuropathy and ordered, um, I think it was an exome diagnostics, and we made the diagnosis of SMA, and everybody was very surprised after so many years. And the second patient was a very young child. So um, this child had symptoms of a generalized muscle weakness and a respiratory insufficiency early after birth. And um, the clinicians also thought about SMA, but the newborn screening was negative. In Germany, the SMA is implemented in the newborn screening. and because there was an urgent clinical suspicion of 5Q SMA, they ordered an MLPA testing. This is the regular way because the the newborn screening is done by a qPCR. And this qPCR, you only see the homozygous deletion. And we thought, okay, let's do MLPA. Maybe it's a heterozygous deletion. We have to find SNV um, on on the second allele afterwards. But the MLPA was negative, and they, I think they even repeated it two times, but it always came back negative. So finally, they did a muscle biopsy, 
found a neurogenic found neurogenic changes and thought it might be in some other kind of infantile motor neuropathies and finally ordered NGS um, exome or panel testing and we identified then um, this child with harboring two SMN1 SNVs and unfortunately the child I think uh, deceased at shortly after the diagnosis was made but probably the treatment would have been difficult anyway because it has to be started very very early and the child had only two SMN2 copies so the progr prognosis wouldn't have been the best but this was the sad story of this child yes yeah I think it's a really fascinating case and yeah I think most neurologists probably have a feeling that their MLPA is a quite a sensitive test um <clears throat> so it's it's really interesting and then equally I think you had some some other interesting findings within the cohort as well Yes, um, we had, we had, um, yeah, first we were, were most surprised by the two patients with the bialylic SNVs, but um, the other finding that we had was that several patients um, were diagnosed by our new workflow that had not the typical clinical picture of SMA. I think this is a pitfall too. So, for example, Teresa, there, I think there's one child yeah, so when we retrospectively looked at all the, the patients we had for diagnostic testing for neuromuscular phenotypes, we actually identified one child with known trisomy 21. Um, but from the age of seven on, he presented with um, progressive gait disorder an increasing weakness and the walking distance got shorter. And by the age of 10, um, the child was actually wheelchair dependent for longer distances and he had elevated CK, um, nerve conduction velocities were unremarkable and then because of this, because it was progressive and all this couldn't be explained by trisomy 21, the attending physicians then decided to go for uh, molecular genetic testing um, and ordered a neuromuscular panel because they suspected a myopathy and actually this boy then with the with the SMA workflow evaluation um, workflow, we detected a homozygous deletion of SMN1 and he was not suspected to have SMA. And in this child, we could diagnose uh, 5Q SMA through the NGS short resequencing testing. Yeah. I think this makes it so valuable because the exome sequencing always is believed as the all-in-one testing. So and first tier testing often, yeah. First tier and all-in-one and in some patients, you just do not clinically suspect that it's SMA. So there's another patient, I think, who was interesting. He He's a, an example of an adult patient who was diagnosed at the age of 47 years, finally. And he was very active in sports. So he, he was playing soccer at the age of 30. You wouldn't believe that it's SMA in a patient like this. And retrospectively, he said that he might have had always difficulties in standing up after falling while playing soccer, but he he only became more evident symptoms after a lumbar disc surgery at, at the age of 44 years because he didn't gain strength afterwards. And the physician then recognized the proximal tetraparesis and also the CK was elevated and he got a muscle biopsy which was inconclusive and the EMG showed some neurogenic changes and so finally they did NGS testing asking for ALS or any kind of limb girdle muscular dystrophy and what came out was the SMA um, and I think this is also a good example of a patient where you yeah you couldn't have the initial suspicion of SMA and um, also this patient he he's now a sitter so he he um his motor function decreased but if he would have been diagnosed early in our days i think he even would have had benefit of the treatment now this is fascinating it's really eye opening um in terms of what how these patients might present um so 
Um, so the the purpose of the project was really to try and improve the sensitivity or see are there cases that were missing of SMA. And the, the full paper is available online. It's called Closing the Gap Detection of 5G Spinal Muscular Atrophy by Short Read Next Generation Sequencing and Unexpected Results in a Diagnostic Patient Cohort. So can you just tell me a bit about the methods that you use to try to overcome challenges in diagnosing SMA? Yeah, so we didn't do that much. We adopted our workflow in NGS short read sequencing by using a bioinformatics pipeline that was so-called SMN2 mask. So this simply means that for SMN1, the paralogous regions that comprise SMN2 were hidden in the reference genome. So we kind of used a, fi a fake reference genome with only SMN1 and no existing SMN2. And consequently, all NGS reads that were generated from either SMN1 or SMN2 were forced to map only to SMN1. And in a subsequent variant filtering workflow, we used then the allele frequencies of one SMN1 unique variant to identify homozygous SMN1 deletions. So this, this variant, it's called a gene determining variant, is a C in SMN1, but it's a T in SMN2. So if the variant calling identified only Ts, but no C, then we knew this must be a homozygous SMN1 deletion. So we were not able to detect heterozygous SMN1 deletions because there is always a variable number of SMN2 copies in each patient. So this was not possible. But we could detect all kinds of pathogenic SNVs in SMN1 because they were called in varying allele frequencies depending on the number of SMN1 and SMN2 copies in an individual patient. For example, a heterozygous SNV in SMN1 would have a variant allele frequency as low as 0.2 in case of two SMN1 and three SMN2 copies. So the allele frequency could be low, but the variant could, could be still heterozygous. By contrast, um, in a patient with a heterozygous SMN1 deletion, a hemozygous SNV may have a variant allele frequency of more than 0.5, what you usually would expect in heterozygous state. And you had access to a really large um, cohort, a really large sample um, size. Yeah, we looked, we looked yes. at a lot of samples. That's true. I think it was 1,600 something where we looked at all kinds of neuromuscular disorders, exomes and panel sequencing and we also had a cohort of, um, I think it was 250 prenatal cases um, because we had the interesting finding of a homozygous SMN1 deletion in a prenatal case. I think there are a few case reports on this in the literature um, in, in fetus with cardiac defects and SMA, I think, but nobody is, is much aware of this. So we would have thought maybe we find some more, but not in our sample. Okay. So do you think your pipeline is something that um, we should be applying every time we are, you know, working up a potential SMA case? Um, well, when you have a potential SMA case, you always have to keep in mind that um, the MLPA and the homozygous deletion is not the full picture. So if you have a strong suspicion of SMA, you should always keep in mind there could be point mutations, um, either biallelic point mutations, uh, SNVs, or um, a deletion and a, um, a pathogenic SNV on the other allele. And you always have to keep that in mind. And then when you have a workup of a potential SMA patient, this is always what you should go back to the lab with and ask, is there any chance we can rule out um, SMN1 pathogenic SNVs? And this is something that clinicians have to keep in mind. On the other hand, in every neuromuscular patient that does not come with a primary diagnosis or clinical suspicion of SMA, an exome testing or large panel testing comes back negative. 
you should always keep in mind that you cannot exclude SMA and that SMA can have atypical manifestations and that you should always then contact the lab if SMN1 pathogenic SNVs can be seen or deletions or even order additional MLPA testing for these patients because it has such huge implications with all the um, therapeutic options that SMA patients have now. Yeah, and it, of course it would be nice if more diagnostic laboratories would adopt this variant filtering workflow with some adoptions to their pipelines because we, I think we could show that it's clinically really helpful to diagnose the patients even if the initial suspicion is not SMA. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's probably the take-home message here, isn't it? Um, and it's mm. been really eye-opening for me um, just to, to learn about um, the things that I, I think might be sensitive tests aren't necessarily, and just to think a bit more carefully and more deeply about these patients. So thank you so much for your time. You've given us a really fantastic explainer about the complex genetics of this disorder um, and on the clinical aspects of it as well. Um, I think the pipeline that you've created is really commendable. Um, and we could see how this could have a really high impact in terms of getting to the right diagnosis for these patients. Um, if our listeners want to find out more about the project, please read the paper, which is um, open access, freely available online at the JND website. So. Thanks so much. And hopefully we'll have you back again on the podcast soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. If you enjoyed the podcast, you can read the full paper and lots more in the Journal of Neuromuscular Diseases. And to keep up to date, you can follow us on social media and subscribe to our newsletter.